Welcome to the Lean Blog Podcast. Visit our website at www.leanblog.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Graben. Hi, it's Mark Graben. It is May 12th, 2020. Welcome to episode 370 of the podcast. Joining me today is Edward Blackman. He's the founder and managing partner of Kelda Consulting. He previously had lean and process improvement focused roles at organizations as varied as Whirlpool, Amway, and Spectrum Health. Today, we're discussing behavioral science and the need to combine practices and lessons from that field with lean and continuous improvement. Edward earned a master's degree in behavioral science, along with undergraduate degrees in psychology and mathematics. He's a certified Six Sigma black belt by the American Society for Quality. He is a lean uh, TPS instructor and coach, a kata coach, a certified scrum master, and an agile coach. So you can learn more. You can read his full bio. You can find a link to his website and more by going to leanblog.org 370. Well, again, our guest today is Edward Blackman. Edward, how are you? I'm great, Mark. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Um, thank you. Thank you for joining us and uh, and, and chatting today. Um, I think we're going to learn a lot personally from the discussion, and, and really happy to share that with others. Um, but you know, before we get into really kind of the the meat of our topics today, I always like to let guests introduce themselves. So I will turn the floor over to you. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, by education, my background uh, as an undergrad was mathematics and psychology, uh, graduate degree in behavioral science. Uh, by experience, I've uh, been in the field for about 20 years now. Uh, worked in most industries, manufacturing, uh, about a decade in healthcare in all aspects of that, uh, the clinics, hospitals, the system, the insurance side as well. Uh, IT is uh, the most recent area that I've been in. I've worked on uh, local scale, regional, national, and uh, global manufacturers as well. Uh, my current company is Kelda Consulting. Uh, we do uh, consulting for small, medium, and large size organizations uh, based on using a combination of behavioral science and continuous improvement. Yeah, and so that's why you know, I'm excited to um, explore and learn from you about that combination. Um, one, one quick follow-up question. What, what's the origin or the, the meaning of the name Kelda Consulting? Uh, yes, uh, I'm a bit of a, a bibliophile, uh, love books. And if anybody's delved into Terry uh, Pratchett's uh, work, uh, the guy is just a genius, was a genius. Uh, but Kelda, the short answer is uh, a word meaning leader. Oh. Okay, and I'm not familiar with uh, with that author's work, unfortunately. But oh, okay, it's uh, okay. actually now's a great time to uh, catch up on the reads, and he's uh, very entertaining. He writes people very well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so with um, you know all your your varied uh, experience in, in different industries, I mean one one thing I'm always interested in ex- in exploring with guests is a little bit of you know how you got introduced uh, to lean or continuous improvement or however you frame it. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, so back in the day, I worked in uh, retail. I worked in a, a regional um, uh, organization that uh, did grocery and hard goods as well, uh, similar to like a Target or a Walmart mm-hmm. superstar. And at the time, we were in the performance management department, and we had signed a contract with GE Financial Division to back our credit card and found out that if you have a business relationship with GE, they will train you in Six Sigma for free. And so about a week after the uh, the ink dried on the contract, we had them on site and teaching us about Six Sigma. And so that was my, my first segue away from performance management and into more of the CI realm, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, from there, I started to learn about lean and uh, if you will, continuous improvement to a production system uh, through a partnership with Herman Miller. Uh, so uh, at the time we had a, a leader who studied Herman Miller, studied the, the great work that they did. And Herman Miller was gracious enough to see that there was a mutually beneficial relationship. They wanted to learn more about healthcare clients. We wanted to learn more about their version of continuous improvement. And so they lent us a sensei, a mentor for about a year embedded with us to learn our, our needs 
and also teach us uh, their version of continuous improvement. It was a, a great relationship. Well, and I think uh, there's an interesting lineage there where um, Herman Miller, I believe, had a, a partnership with Toyota at one point and, and Toyota, I know there, there's some different histories where Toyota worked with Alcoa. And when you said mutually beneficial partnership, that seems to be the common theme here, right? I mean, learning about their customers, helping, help, you know, it's just kind of all around getting better together and learning from yeah. each other. Yeah, they, uh, so they had, uh, they were going through rough times uh, uh, about 15 years ago, I think it was and needed help, they sought uh, TSSC, a uh, division of Toyota, to help mm-hmm. them out. And uh, Mr. Yeah. Oba, uh, Oba, Oba-san, yes. uh, sent <laughs> them and provided guidance to them on their approach. And he set down some uh, extremely difficult challenges for them to meet, to demonstrate that they would be, if you will, worthy learners. And they met the challenge. And he continued to mentor them after that. And so then um, and we'll, we'll probably, I think, be able to intersperse um, and, you know, lean concepts and lessons and examples from, from your work with the behavioral science um, side of things. So um, I was wondering, you know, first, you know, before talking about kind of connections um, to lean or other continuous improvement methods for, for the uninitiated, for, <clears throat> boy, the uninitiated, um, could you give just a bit of uh, an introduction, you know, kind of to the, the, the boundaries around behavioral science and, and, and what that means? Oh, certainly. Uh, so by history, um, you know, everybody's probably heard of uh, Pavlov. Uh, we call that mm-hmm. classical conditioning um, in behavioral psychology, or behavioral science. Uh, then along came Dr. Skinner, who created something that's called operant uh, conditioning, which is a, a very different version from Pavlovian uh, conditioning, basically. I, I don't want to get overly techy on this one, but uh, if you can see it with a video camera, uh, it's probably behavior. If you can't, mm. then it's probably not behavior. And, and so that's sort of the, the layman version of, am I actually discussing behavior? Okay. And yeah. uh, the, the important bit up on that is we dealt with behavior because uh, it's something that's scientifically falsifiable. Uh, so we can actually test whether or not we're influencing behavior because we can have multiple people agree on whether or not, you know, did Mark pick up the pencil? Uh, you know, did Mark um, follow the JIT correctly? Right. Well, if you have multiple independent observers, then you can actually say, yes, we all agree that that happened. Whereas if we ask, you know, Mark, I want you to think about the pencil or <laughs> I want you to think about the just-in-time training. Well, it's very difficult to val- validate whether or not that happened. And therefore, we try to focus on the observable behaviors because it's, it's scientific. So there's now, a difference between observing a leader leave their office and go on a gimbal walk. You can observe that behavior. What, what you can't prove or disprove is uh, some of their mindsets. If they're going on this gimbal walk intent on finding people who are screwing up, that's, we, we may see behavior that suggests a certain mindset. Is that fair to say? It, that's correct. And we can try to interpret it and talk about motivations and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say uh, um, it's a common misconception that people don't consider vocal or verbal behavior part of behavior, but there's an entire division within behavioral science that focuses just on, um, if you will, vocal behavior. And so the words that leaders use matter a lot Mm -hmm. as well. And so when they're on those gimbal walks, are they using words uh, that are in an inquisitive nature? Are they asking questions about the current condition, right? Or do they show up and, you know what, 95% of the time, the leader's doing the talking, right? Mm-hmm. So quantify that as well. Well, that's not an inquisitive. That's not a uh, learning mindset, if right. you will. Right. Uh, a learning mindset would be interpreted as somebody that asks questions, somebody that listens, and we can actually quantify that by the amount of time that they're in the Gemba and the amount of time of that, if you look at a pie chart, that they're actually demonstrating these behaviors that we desire. 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 helpful. Um, so, are there you know, before we talk about connections with Lean, are are there other kind of I guess foundational concepts or branches of behavioral science that are worth um, sketching out? Yeah, uh, so there's uh, typically uh, people go into two areas within behavioral science. Uh, they'll go into the uh, developmental disabilities or uh, autism spectrum disorder uh, field, or they'll go into the organizational behavior field. And so uh, my background, actually, I started on the, the DD route. I, I worked with kids labeled autistic and then uh, ventured into the organizational behavior area, and I stayed with that. Uh, and honestly, uh, to give another uh, plug related to Toyota, uh, one of the reasons that I continue to study and apply lean versus more of the Six Sigma stuff is I found it um, uh, validated uh, by the behavioral science approach. So uh, whether or not folks at Toyota or the people that learn and apply lean uh, actually understand the what's called the mechanisms of action, why the stuff works that they use actually works. Uh, but, but it is um, very much uh, supported and validated by behavioral science. So can, can you give an example of that? Yes. Uh, so uh, one of the, uh, uh, um, I'll just mention his name, Ted Larned was the uh, sensei lent to us by Herman Miller. And we asked him, how do you know that somebody is improving on their, their continuous improvement journey? How do you know they're getting better at it? Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, one of the things that they look for, that they learned by, from Obasan was scripting. So are people using the words and are they using them correctly, right? So when they're approaching a problem solving scenario, are they using, and we can delve into the A3 example, are they using left side wording or right side word? So when they approach uh, a problem, are they trying to understand the symptoms versus the root cause or right out of the gate, are they suggesting solutions? And uh, right. so that falls right in line with the, the verbal analysis that I mentioned earlier, that we're able to actually link uh, verbal behavior with the desired problem solving approaches that we want. Oh. And, and, you know, to be honest, Mark, I can geek out on this stuff all day long. So you're going to have to, <laughs> have to oh, throw out no. on this one. But I, I find this stuff fascinating just because it's so effective. Yeah. yeah so, uh, um, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, no, I was going to say geeking out on this is fine. That's what this podcast is all about. So, um, so let, I mean, you, you've given a, a bit of an introduction and we're going to delve deeper into um, some of the techniques that connect to continuous improvement. But, um, you know, starting with the why, um, why is it important? Why do, why do you think it's important to connect behavioral science to lean and continuous improvement? You know, uh, so I got an anecdote about that. About five years into my career, I was at a, a wedding uh, reception and just exchanging pleasantries with somebody. And you know, I told them where I worked and what I was doing and uh, performance management and you know, working in the retail field. And uh, she goes, oh, what's your education? Oh, you know, behavioral science, psychology. And she goes, oh, that's so sad. What do you mean? Yeah. Right. Oh, well, you don't get to apply any of your degree. And, and I was puzzled by the statement. Right. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, and I can you know, honestly turn this around uh, on you as well. I, I would say that most of my career, uh, over 90% of the conversations I have are around, why did this person do that? <laughs> I wanted them to do this other thing instead. Their behavior just doesn't make sense. And, and you know what, there's, there's an actual field out there. There's a science that can help us answer those questions. Hmm. So that's where I think the, the power of behavioral science comes in is to help demystify uh, why people perform the way that they do. So when you talk about behavior that doesn't make sense, is it more a matter of, um, I mean, the, the behavior makes sense to them, but there, there's some difference in the person we're observing and you know, we wish they were behaving differently. There's, there's a different mindset or there's some different 
principles or they're, they're, there's got to be like, they, it seemed like, like they wouldn't be doing it if it didn't make sense. You, right? you know, I, I love your logic, Mark. You're, you're, you're dead on there. You, you hit kind of the, the main point is that the behavior uh, almost always makes sense to the individual. The onus is on the observer, the, the external person to figure out why it makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Because most people do behave rationally. And so if we go with that assumption that the, the human, the performer, is behaving in a way that makes sense to him or her, then let's do an analysis to figure out why it makes sense. Right? Mm -hmm. So why is the person continuing to use paper charts instead of our brand new fancy electronic mm -hmm. metaphor? Right? It just doesn't make sense. It's yeah. easier. It's digitized. Look at all these great charts you can create with it. Right? Yeah. Right. Well, They've worked on paper charts for 25 years, right? Switching over to a, a new behavior that seems more difficult um, uh, than the old is perfectly understandable that it's hard for them. And one of the things that we look at is uh, there's an analysis called response cost. Uh, and that's where we'll find there's a lot of terms and terminology within behavioral science, the paradigm, uh, that have analogs uh, to lean as well. All right, so we you know look at a cost benefit grid would be another way of doing an analysis. What's mm -hmm. the benefit uh, to the individual performer of doing this new behavior versus the old behavior? Right. Yeah, and you think about um, cost benefit or reasons to use the electronic medical record and reasons to continue using paper charting or reasons to go out and do Gemba walks and, and reasons to stay um, in, in someone's office. I mean, the, the, the little bit I've tried studying, I, I've got, I, I could geek out on this. So I've gotten really fascinated about it and read and done a couple of podcasts on the topic of uh, motivational interviewing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the one thing that, that I've, I think key takeaway from motivational interviewing is casting aside, um, you know, phrase resistance to change and, and instead thinking about ambivalence mm. and, you know, that, that person um, may say things like, well, I know I should use the electronic medical record, but then they also have reasons not to. And, and it seems like motivational interviewing and maybe other behavioral science, it's not about making people do, what we want, but helping them get unstuck. And, and maybe they, they can talk about the benefits and, and you know, motivational interviewing would ask, we, we, we would try to get someone to articulate the benefits instead of just lecturing them about what the benefits are. Right? Mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of uh, concepts that we could unravel there. Uh, you know, I like to, I heard a smart person say one time, uh, people aren't resistant to change. They're resistant to being changed. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're actually part of the change and they actually are invested in it, in developing ideas, uh, then uh, when it comes time to test out or experiment with or implement their ideas, well, they're their ideas. They're not somebody else's. So they don't um, find resistance to them because they're actually invested in seeing whether or not they succeed or fail. Uh, versus taking somebody else's idea and trying to make it work. Yeah. Uh, one of the um, really basic analyses that we can do to see whether or not you know, we have an alignment between behavior and the outcomes that we want to see as an organization is to look at their time. And so, you know, we've mentioned the, the office versus the gamble, you know, the shop floor. Uh, as CI people, you and I like leaders to be out on the shop floor as much as possible, wherever that is. Um, and yes, even the IT environment has a shop floor. Uh, so are leaders actually doing that? Well, let's analyze their calendars. Um, you know, yeah. Google calendars, uh, Outlook. There's a lot of really basic ways that we could run a quick analysis and see, you know, is the leader spending a majority of uh, her time in uh, their office, uh, in meetings with other leaders at the same level? Or are they spending time with their direct reports? Are they spending time... Uh, on the shop floor. And we can further that analysis by looking at uh, training and development too. If a core tenant of an organization is, you know, I, we want to be a learning organization, right? It uh, uh, keeps becoming a popular term. 
Well, if we're truly a learning organization, how much of our time do we actually spend learning? And we can break this down into chunks if we wanted to, right? How much time did we spend last week learning or last month? If the answer is zero, then can we truly say that we're a learning organization? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess it, you know, it comes back again to what's, uh, what, what's observable. And um, you can observe if somebody is going out to the Gemba um, and, and, and I, think, <laughs> I was just chuckling because I was thinking back to um, uh, back when I worked in manufacturing, you know, the assumption that we want leaders to be in the Gemba as much as possible. Sometimes that assumption gets uh, invalidated when you see how the leaders are behaving when they're out on the Gemba. <laughs> so like just being physically out there is um, just one of the observable uh, behaviors. Uh, right. Some leaders who I thought, well, you know, it's probably better if they stay in the office. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, turns out we can... Uh do. Uh, so if one of our goals is to get leaders to go out and let's let's use healthcare uh, hospitals as the example, if we want leaders, uh, you know, to follow Dr. Toussaint's example from uh, formerly from Thetaker, mm -hmm. uh, if we want people to follow his example where he's, you know, he was the CEO and he learned that he should be spending a lot of his time on the, the floors uh, in his hospital, seeing what's actually going on. Uh, well, we can look at what would make that difficult for a leader. Well, one, and you just kind of hit on it, what should I be doing when I get there? Mm -hmm. And so we have to uh, actually shadow, mentor, and teach and train leaders what behaviors we expect of them when they go to the gamble, right? Another is, it's going to be weird. They've not done it before. It's the first time they're going out there. So it's going to be weird for the leader. It's going to be weird for the, the workers on the floor to see the leader. Uh, but that weirdness fades. Um, that's where it becomes the new normal. We want it to actually be odd if the leader isn't seen on the Gemba, in the Gemba uh, for a period of time. Right? Yeah. So there's a lot of, lot of uh, uh, we call them contingencies but links between uh, behavior and consequences. Uh, so we, um, these are often called operants, but we want to link um, the operants uh, together and see why behavior uh, is or is not happening. And, mm -hmm. and so we, uh, uh, one of the ways that we look at this is uh, something called an exemplary uh, performer or an exemplar is the, the mm -hmm. short term for it. The, the latest term for that is a positive deviant. And there's actually mm, yeah. a book on this topic. Right. So let's say we're a healthcare system and we have a dozen C-suite executives or vice presidents. And one of those executives is actually exhibiting the behavior that we want. Uh, she's on the shop floor. She's interacting. She's asking questions. She's not performing command and control. She's learning and she's providing you know, direction. Yeah. Great. Let's directly observe that leader, see what makes it easy for her to do this, these behaviors. And then, um, and, and here's a, the um, key point, then we take one other executive and have him trained by her. We don't take the entire C-suite, we don't take all the leaders, we run an experiment. Mm -hmm. And we see if that one leader, that one positive deviant can train and develop one more. And then we do it one by one and develop leaders that way. Uh, so the, if we're struggling for ideas on how to develop new behaviors, um, uh, solutions, if you will, things like that, we can always look for positive deviants or, or exemplars. So what you bring up, I'd like to delve a little more into this one-by-one -one approach, which is um, really interesting, of, you know, thing of doing an experiment and uh, you know, taking, taking time, um, you know, I'm reminded of, you know, the, I would call it a lean method training within industry that relies very much on one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, training and, and, you know, coaching and, um, you know, it's, it's not the fastest, but uh, approach for training somebody, but arguably it's more uh, effective. Um, you know, to, to go and, you know, test for confirmation of understanding and test for confirmation of ability to do 
you know, it might be, for example, a, a repetitive manufacturing job. But when we come to leaders and, um, well, you know, I want to hear more of your thoughts about this one, uh, one-to-one approach, one-by-one, um, as opposed to organizations I see where it's, it's tempting um, you know, to throw everybody into a large classroom and have them sit through a couple of lectures and then um, say, you know, go forth and do lead. And I it's just, I, I wouldn't believe the hypothesis that that would be really effective, but it seems faster. So I like, um, so I wonder if you could elaborate on that. Would people say, well, we don't have time to go one by one. <laughs> uh, I, um, I, I completely understand your point. The, the distinction in training and development between effectiveness and efficiency, right? Yeah. It, it's yeah. highly efficient to get a hundred th- people through <laughs> a one hour uh, uh, lean course and call them yellow belt certified. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, that's, I, I would call that highly efficient, not very effective. Yeah. Uh, and, and so how do we know? Well, uh, every, and I'm going to preach a little bit here, but in my mind, every, uh, training event, uh, um, that we have class that we have should always be a learning cycle system unto itself. So, uh, how do we know if the training is actually effective? Right. Well, people, you know, rated us five stars on the, uh, the training <laughs> product survey. Okay, was the goal of the training to get five stars <laughs> on a survey? Right. No. What was it? And, and this is, honestly, this is a, another plug for behavioral science. This is where behavioral science can help uh, finish that sentence for people. Because this is the point where people tend to struggle with actually describing the desired behaviors that they're looking for. Well, we want them to be more innovative, or we want them uh, to care more, or we want them to be more proactive. Um, you know, all, all these are, are true struggles that I've experienced. Okay, can you give me an example of somebody that you consider proactive? Okay, so we've narrowed it down a little bit. Okay, now can you give me a scenario with that person where you saw them being proactive, uh, a meeting or a project or something like that? And we can start to identify what those behaviors are that they're calling proactive behaviors. And then once we have those identified, we can actually measure those, you know, rate of occurrence, things like that, amount of time, duration. There's a lot of performance measurements that we can use. And then we can say, okay, let's hold one training event where we're trying to teach proactivity. And then afterwards, we're going to measure for a period of time, let's say Uh two weeks, and see whether or not those proactive behaviors are exhibited. If, you know, and the smart aleck answer is, if we see that they're exhibited zero times, I'm going to call our training ineffective. Yeah. Right? So, but this is where we have to come up with the measures before we do training to the masses. Um, Otherwise, it's a complete waste. Um, I'm trying to, I'm struggling with the proper attribution of this, but, uh, a smart person one time uh, talked about competence by chance. We don't want to be accidentally competent. We want to be intentionally competent. And that includes our training. Right. Yeah. And it, so I, mean, I guess the thing that puts the science in behavioral science is being disciplined about forming and articulating a hypothesis in advance of the experiment, right? And not uh, twisting whatever happened to say, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's what we predicted or somehow defining that as success after the fact, right? Very, very well said, Mark. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, it, it can be a struggle. You know, I, I completely understand most people aren't geeks and didn't study behavioral science. Um, uh, to my regrets, uh, behavioral science is not taught in high school education um, mm. uh, or necessarily a requirement in college. Uh, I really think it should be. Uh, how many times um, uh, do you interact with other humans right, <laughs> versus um, working on trigonometry? Now, right. you know, I, granted, I have a degree in math, so I, I do like <laughs> that as well. But the frequency of use of certain skills should influence education, in my opinion. Um, so, you know, and the, the classic grip on that one is taxes. Right? I was never taught how to do taxes in high school, yeah. um, but it does seem to come up every day and year. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, so it's just kind of closing the loop a little bit on behavior before we kind of look at some other contributions from behavioral science. Um, 
So just a, sort of a, um, I'm struggling with the word, a platitude about um, what we, we need leaders to be more innovative. That's mm. in and of itself not observable behavior, but then that's where you have to go and break it down and define what behaviors demonstrate innovation. Right. And, and so one approach to that for, you know, innovation is I, I'm a firm supporter of innovation. I think it's a great thing. Uh, the way I tend to divide, uh, define it is similar to, uh, I think, how uh, Toyota defines this, but I appreciate it if you keep me honest, Mark. Um, it's the uh, volume of ideas that are tested and tried, and, mm -hmm. and hopefully um, some are actually implemented. Right. So the classic example I, I've read about a lot is, you know, the number of ideas generated by traditional North American uh, car manufacturers versus Toyota. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and this is, you know, these are dated articles, but at one point in time, they would talk about uh, one to three ideas per employee um, in North America versus uh, what was it? A hundred or a thousand by Toyota. The, the number is a huge behind. difference. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, the generation of ideas, um, just by sure probability, you're going to have um, uh, more that are actually implemented if you generate more. And so one way to behaviorally define innovation is the number of ideas generated. Mm -hmm. uh, the next level of that measure is the number of ideas implemented. <laughs> right. Right. Um, both of those are, are very telling indicators. And uh, unfortunately, one of the struggles organizations have right now that want to be innovative or want to learn more and grow faster than their competitors is when they're asked how many ideas were generated by your employees last year. The, and tell me if you already know the answer, Mark. No, go, go ahead. I'm guessing, but I'll let you go ahead. Uh, they, uh, the answer is typically, I don't know. Right. Well, well, you know what, you know, what's, what's sad also is if you ask leaders, um, what's your, what's your lost workday incident rate? And they might not know that either, which is, I guess, in a way, a behavior that illustrates, like, it's one thing for an organization to say, well, safety is always our top priority. Well, what are the behaviors that demonstrate that safety is always the top priority? It's not just knowing the metric, but I would guess exactly. knowing the metrics probably correlates very strongly with having a deep involvement in trying to improve safety. Exactly, and we and we can quantify that in a, a number of ways to help us learn whether or not we're making progress on it. Uh, one of the most recent transformations I did was with an executive IT team uh, for a global manufacturer, and you know, starting out of the gate, we had to talk about the standard five KPIs: um, you know, safety, quality, delivery, cost, and morale. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, well, what does that mean in an IT setting, right? So we we I worked with the executive team and we came up with definitions for each of those for IT. And you know, in IT world, safety tends to equate to security, uh, protected health information, things like that, uh, data breaches, uh, keep them the CIOs. Uh, name out of the media <laughs> uh, with one of the ways they defined it, uh, which I was uh, I thought comical. Uh, but we we came up with those measures, but then we also prioritized them. And, and here was the big learning experience for the executive team: is if you want your people to prioritize work and the completion of work the same way that you do, you need to make it very simple and understandable and um, explainable by yourself, right? So the CI person shouldn't be the one defining security. Uh, the security folks should come up with that. And so if you're uh, having a conversation with a project manager and he says, you know, the project's going to be late and the executive asks why, and the project manager says, well, uh, we found a potential uh, hole in our security and we need two more weeks uh, to patch the hole. The only answer that we desire from the executive is good. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what you should do. Or, or I was going to say maybe like, I was going to say maybe thank you it would, yes, might also yes. be a good response. Right? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Good prioritization, right? So they prioritize safety over delivery, you know, instead of 
uh, hitting uh, the production goals for pushing out the quality or the uh, pushing out the code, they prioritize safety over that. And so the thing is, if they want their prioritization to be in that order, safety, quality, delivery, cost, and morale, then we would want how many people in their organization to prioritize the work the same way? And the short answer is, well, ideal state is 100%. We want everybody in the organization to prioritize the work the same way. Mm -hmm. Great. How do we get them to exhibit those behaviors? And, And the short answer is we make it very easy for them. And we reinforce it when it does happen. And so this gets into a, another piece about uh, feedback systems and uh, what's called the, the common phrase um, when we talk about feedback and operants is uh, all antecedents and no consequences. And, and so what that tends so in to plain, In plain language? No. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, so so uh, yeah. It, in mean? plain language, all antecedents and no consequences means um, antecedents are things like uh, I'm warning you, Mark, don't mess up. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's an antecedent. That's something that happens uh, before your behavior occurs. Yeah. And then the consequence is, well, Mark, um, you, you, you messed up the quality on it, right? Uh, the, the widget didn't quite come up to, to snuff, right? Well, that never happens. We, um, no consequence means there's no follow-up, there's no learning cycle, there's no corrective action, there's no learning that happens afterwards. So we don't yeah. teach you, Mark, this is how quality should have happened, or we don't help you when we see, oh, the quality of your widget was off, can you help me understand what the struggles were to meet the quality specs, All right? So instead, we just come back and say, Okay, this time I really mean it, Mark. Don't mess up next time. I, I really mean it. And, and to help um, make sure I'm doing this right, I'm going to start putting up some posters and say, you know, we really mean quality this time. So these these are antecedents, not consequences. Hmm. Um, I was wondering if we could um, uh, kind of go back and dove into safety a little bit in the context of um, IT. Oh, sure. And software settings, because you know, something we you said safety often gets translated into security. But then, like some of the things that came up, the examples of you know, it's not let the boss get in the news, and let's not um, like it sounds like there 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 are consequences or there there's fear, and like this isn't physical safety, but it seems more connected to either you could call it professional safety or psychological safety. And that doesn't seem as easily measurable as physical harms. Like it's pretty cut and dry if somebody got cut physically in a manufacturing workplace and it's observable and measurable that yes, they missed time at work because of it. Um, I don't know if this is a rhetorical question or if this is something you can speak to, but um, how do we observe or measure emotional harms in that type of workplace that might be really fear-driven and, and dysfunctional in other ways. Um, so Mark, I, I can see why you're considered such an expert in the field. Uh, you're, you're, these are absolutely excellent questions. Uh, so uh, physical uh, safety in the workplace versus uh, mental safety or psychological mm-hmm. safety. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, both are important. And, yeah. and I'm gonna do a twist on a classic term called accountability and talk about accountability partners. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, as a behaviorist, uh, um, I'm able to see whether or not the executive is putting somebody uh, in a psychologically unsafe condition. But uh, I'm only one person. So how do we develop uh, one another as accountability partners for the types of behaviors that we desire? And so uh, if we see that a vice president uh, for example, is uh, mad, right? We can all define mad. We've seen mad. <laughs> we can observe yeah. mad a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. We can operationally define it and measure it and all that kind of stuff. Or we can just say, you know what, Bob, you were really mad and it seemed like you were making it unsafe for um, uh, Jen to tell you the problems that we had. Um, and the reason what was going on, uh, the reason that we um, missed our production targets. Now, what do you mean? Well, do you notice how Jen went quiet, right? 
in the, the classic phrase, and leaders that don't listen will soon have um, people that don't talk. Mm-hmm. That's there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. So if you're not self-aware, and, and that's a, a term I struggle with a little bit, but if you're not self-aware that you're creating an unsafe psychological environment, we need accountability partners. We need to, and this is very much in line with the Andon Cord. Um, when a psychologically unsafe condition is occurring, we need a signal. We need to pull the end on and say, you know what? The worker's just doing exactly what we wanted them to do. Please don't respond in that way, right? So we need two things. We need a way to signal that an unsafe, psychologically unsafe condition mm-hmm. is happening. And we need a way defined that we're going to respond to it. Now, in this case, accountability partners are the end on, right? Mm-hmm. They're Mm-hmm. The more that you have, the more accountability partners that you have that are trained on this approach can help you say, yes, you know what? It wasn't just my impression. You know, um, five people in the room all agreed that this was an unsafe conversation. Okay. So we signaled the and on, we signaled unsafe. Now, how do we respond to that? All right. Well, I wasn't being mean. You guys are exaggerating. Oh, being sensitive. Oh, don't be so thin skinned. Come on, grow up. Right. Yeah. No, we, we all defined in our training, our accountability training, that those are incorrect responses to an and on poll. The correct responses were, okay, what do you think happened? What do we think happened? What should happen differently next time? <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, and by the way, do I need to go back and apologize to Jen? Mm-hmm. Right. And so uh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Menlo Innovations. No, yeah, yeah. I've, I've uh, interviewed uh, Rich Sheridan on the podcast and visited um, their company once. Okay, okay, yeah. I, I, I think the world of Rich and his crew, yeah. um, they, um, uh, they do great work out there. In uh, Rich's latest book, um, he talks about one of these exact scenarios where – you know, it's it's very easy to get you know CEO syndrome or president syndrome, and, and um, behave in an unrestricted manner. And so, uh, he gave a poor response uh, to one of his coders, one of his developers, and later on was called out on it by an accountability partner. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the next day, went back and apologized to the individual. Wow. Now, now here's the thing. That was an interaction between one CEO and one, uh, if you will, coder. But the power of that story went throughout the entire organization, Yeah. right? And, and that's one of the beautiful things is these, all behavior is observed. It, it just, it, it is. And, and what story do you want to have told about that? Uh, in healthcare, we used to talk about service recovery quite a bit. Mm-hmm. It, it's really bad. Um, to have an adverse event happen, um, it's worse if you respond to it poorly. And so how do we do service recovery properly and actually turn a poor experience into a lifelong loyal individual? Um, and, and our stories help with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, you, you mentioned, um, you know, performance and uh, Performance management. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on um, what behavioral science brings to us, understanding things like um, strategy deployment, and when mm-hmm. you know uh, pe- people are trying to meet goals and targets, or when organizations uh, are, are trying to evaluate individual performance. Um, what, what are what are some things that come to mind that are useful? Certainly, and, and so uh, I want to preface this real quick by. Um, uh, saying that uh, this is the elephant analogy. So um, people often think uh, about performance management based on their own personal experiences with it. So, you know, if uh, uh, six uh, uh, visually impaired individuals touch an elephant, they're all going to describe it based on the piece that they touch. So elephants like a tree, if you're touching the leg, it's like a wall, if you're touching the side, it's like a snake, if you're touching the tail, so on. So uh, from my experience, a lot of people have had poor interactions with performance management teams or performance management departments, and they're typically punitive. It's punishment department, right? Not performance management. 
And so performance management can actually do quite a bit from a behavioral science perspective to help um, develop uh, high performers. And there's a, a thing uh, by uh, Thomas Gilbert. Um, so he's a, a great uh, author, a great individual, or uh, was a great individual. He wrote the book um, uh, about behavioral engineering and uh, developing human competence. And so he gets into, is the individual actually set up for success and, and looks at an analysis uh, on how you see whether or not they're set up for success or not. Uh, one of the pieces that we look at with this is their, again, their time allocation. So if we're delving into Hoshin Conry or strategy development and deployment, one of the premises for strategy development and deployment is it's not a once and done thing, right? So we don't right. develop the strategy, put it up on the shelf, let it collect dust and bring it down at the end of the year and see how we did on it. It's a constant iterative experiment and we're constantly doing feedback. So one of the things that we can look at, and, and I'm a big fan of Obias, uh, you know, large mm -hmm. room. To, if it's important, I like the way Nationwide talks about it. If it's important, um, it should be on the wall. And, uh, you know, it can be a digital wall, particularly given um, recent events. But um, if it's important, it should be visual and it should be discussed frequently. Mm -hmm. And so if your strategy is truly important to you, how often do you talk about it? How often do you check to see if you're performing in alignment with your predicted strategy? Uh, it, uh, I would say that typically strategy should be discussed on a frequent basis. I would call that weekly, um, uh, minimal. Um, my preference is actually a couple times a week. Yeah. Um, and so you can look at an analysis of your calendar at the executive team and see, you know, did we discuss our strategy last week? how long did we dedicate to discussing it? And again, if the answer is zero, then I'm wondering how important our strategy actually is. Um, another piece is the, the check piece. So every time we make a decision, do we make a decision with some anchored scale? And uh, so there's a thing called uh, behaviorally anchored rating scale, uh, BARS for short. Uh, but um, the way that that would apply in this setting is uh, should we do A or B? And a uh, common way to answer that is, well, let's vote. Uh, it seems like a majority vote says we should do B. Or, you know, I'm the hippo. I'm the highest paid person's opinion. <laughs> right. So yeah. I think we should do B. Yeah. The answer that we would love to see instead from a, a Hoshin Connery perspective is, which one lines up with our strategy for the year? Right? So, oh, it turns out A lines up with our strategy better. Wow. Okay. So that's a, a used strategy. It's actually providing some sort of anchor guidance for us. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. And and it's I, it's just interesting. You, you make me think about coming back to um, observable behaviors and, and instead of just... Um, well, my friend Pascal Dennis, who was with Toyota in, in Canada for uh, a long time, and he's been a mentor, I, I would call him a sensei to me, um, you know, avoiding uh, happy talk and, mm -hmm. and making sure we're um, you know, dealing with the real reality in terms of performance and the status of our experiments and our improvement efforts. So maybe, I, I, maybe that's, that's um, just to kind of close up the thought that's observable behavior. Is a leader just spouting happy talk or are they facing the real reality in a, in a way that's more helpful? Yeah. He, he's an excellent author. I, I love his work, uh, all his books. Uh, and I can't remember if he's the individual that would often bring up the question, how would we know? Mm -hmm. How would we know if our strategy is uh, on or off? How would we yeah. know if the decision that we just made lines up with our strategy? <laughs> right. right. It, it's such a deep question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then when you talk about setting people up for success, you know, it's kind of triggered a couple um, thoughts. Um, you know, one is, is thinking about the influence of uh, Dr. Deming, who said the role of a leader, I'm paraphrasing, but um, I think it's pretty close. The role of a leader is not to judge. The role of a leader is to help people improve. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about punitive um, uh, systems um, or 
you know, uh, things like you know, if, if, if leaders are constantly blaming their employees, at some point you have to ask who's, who's, who, whose responsibility is it that, that you've hired these supposedly bad employees? <laughs> um, we're going to send those bad employees back to training. We're going to retrain them. They're like, well, if the training uh, wasn't effective the first time and that leads you to label them as a bad employee, how is repeating the same ineffective training? Exactly. <laughs> likely to make things better and, and, and how would you know? But the other, the other thought I just wanted to share back is, you know, um, setting people up for success. It, 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 like the, the Toyota people I know have this feeling of deep responsibility for that. And I, I often quote and cite um, my friend, um, Daryl Wilburn, who, who says basically, um, I think this is a pretty direct quote. I think he always says it the same way. It's the responsibility of leaders to provide a system in which people can be successful. And like that, boy, like that, that, that summarizes a lot of it. Like how, how many organizations say they are implementing lean, but yet don't share that same belief um, I, I think things like that are, are just so fundamental, but they're overlooked by um, a lot of people who say, well, oh, yeah, yeah we, uh, we, um, we are implementing the mechanisms of strategy deployment. Yeah. You, you may see an Obeya room, but it doesn't mean they're really practicing that or exhibiting the same behaviors you might see in a place where that's effective. It, exactly. And to, to build on that a little bit, um, I think you said Daryl Wilburn. I'm going to have to look him up. Yeah, um, Daryl Wilburn. Yeah, he was right. in uh, Kentucky and he helped stand up the San Antonio plant and he still lives in the San Antonio area. Ah, OK. Uh, uh, so one of the things I like to talk about is uh, when uh, we ask is an individual set up for success, that's the, the first question we ask. We don't ask what's wrong with the person. <laughs> right. Because um, the majority of uh, individuals, performers, workers, uh, humans come to work trying to do a good job. Yes. So if we start with that basic assumption, then we ask, you know, were they set up for success? Um, if we try to flip that order and say, well, yep, they were, uh, they must be set up for success. I'm a great leader. Um, they must have just hired a bad one. And no, right. no, right. no. Right. It, most of the time, they're not set up for success. And there's actually different analyses that we can do on that. I, I know we're running low on time, but no, uh, there's a, a cool thing called a picnic analysis that you can look at to see whether or not they're set up for success or the, you know, the behavioral engineering model is really useful for that, um, along with a lot of the CI tools, right? Uh, yeah. So there's, it's a beautiful marriage of the two paradigms. Well, and, and maybe, you know, we can um, take a deeper dive in, into some of this in um, another podcast or in other ways. But I know you've got a couple of recommendations of uh, what, what people could do if they want to learn more about behavioral science. Yeah, certainly. I, I'd love to talk about this more. Uh, maybe in the future, we could delve into specific case study examples. Oh, yeah. 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 To, to, yeah. And delve into, you know, whatever is of interest to IT manufacturing, you know, um, whatever area would be fine, interesting, but we could go into a specific one where we did an analysis and use the CI thinking and behavioral thinking to, to talk about uh, how we got to root cause and how we tested out solutions and stuff like that or tested out ideas. Uh, but uh, other places that you, we can go or folks can go if they want to learn more, um, uh, you know, they can go to what's called the uh, Business Science Magazine. It's a behaviorally science uh, approach. Uh, and there's a number of behavioral scientists, practitioners uh, that are in the field, not necessarily just academics that uh, write about this and how they've applied it in the field. So business science magazine, uh, um, uh, you can find, you can find my company's website, Kelda Consulting. So it's a K-E-L-D-A consulting um, on LinkedIn and Twitter and mm -hmm. the website as well. There's also a, a organization called the Organizational Behavior Management Network, uh, uh, for short, OBM Network. And it's a bunch of practitioners as well that have been applying this stuff in the field. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of uh, content that's available. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I would say that most of the content is more academically written. Mm -hmm. and so I, I know there's not a lineup of people going to read textbooks 
So, but that is one of the things that the field is working on is to try to have less academic writing and more applied writing uh, oh, available. Okay. Because like you said earlier, even if we haven't had the chance to study it formally, we all deal with other people. And that means we're better off if we understand uh, behaviors. So yeah, that's absolutely. That's well, great. Um, well, Edward, thank you so much for uh, being a guest and you know introducing a lot of concepts and, and I think connecting dots for myself and I'm, I'm sure a lot of the listeners. So I, I'll, I'll make sure you know the blog post for this episode has links um, to, to your website, to your LinkedIn profile, um, the other resources um, that you mentioned. So um, Edward, I hope, I hope we can do it again sometime. I really, um, really appreciate you taking time to be a guest here. Oh, thank you, Mark. I appreciate the invitation. It was a lot of fun. Uh, stay healthy, sir. I, I agree. And yeah, please uh, be well. <laughs> Thanks for listening. This has been the Lean Blog Podcast. For lean news and commentary updated daily, visit www.leanblog.org. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast, email mark at leanpodcast at gmail.com.